Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, move on here now to our next topic. And hopefully none of you joined a cult, uh, you know, became a heretic during the lunch break. So, so now uh, let's uh, move on now. Look at another way to categorize doctrine that actually relates to the issue of heresy and orthodoxy. And this is, this is a big one. I've already, you've read through it, briefly mentioned it, but I want to try and put it together for you a little bit. And that's the area of what is essential Christian doctrine. Okay? Hence the name of the course. And here, probably the most important thing is remember, uh, we say essential, and we're going to be using this kind of language throughout our entire studies in systematic theology, but I'm um, going to start with, I mean, the concept of what's, you know, an essence. And, and I'll say this multiple times as I hit the multiple subjects, but uh, bottom line is, is that you talk to any number of philosophers or theologians, uh, everybody's got a little bit different nuance in the way they do metaphysics or ontology. So you see words like essence or substance or nature. Not everybody is going to have the exact same definition for that. So, so that's why they're common terms you're going to find in our discussions, but you find out everybody has a little bit different take on it. So uh, with mostly a lot of conceptual overlap. So what I use are, you know, what makes sense to me is I use uh, Aristotelian definitions metaphysically, what's essence, substance, subsistent, mode of subsistence, and... But the most important thing is to think through it conceptually, then put the label on it, so at least you can keep the ideas straight. Um, no matter what you're dealing with, whether it's my class or somebody else's, at least have them go through conceptually and then put a label on it and distinguish the ideas. That way at least you can uh, you know, refine your discussion and make it more beneficial. But in this case, when we, th we say essence, the essence of something, and this is what we really talk about as the first category uh, of doctrine, what, what is the essence of Christianity? Okay. Uh, in other words, what makes Christianity precisely what it is as Christianity and not another thing? Okay. So in other words, essence is that which makes something precisely what it is and not something else, or different ways of saying it, the properties or qualities that make a thing precisely what it is and not something else. Those qualities that identify a particular thing. So we think about essence, concept of essence would be, for example, if you have a genus, you know, whether, you know, dogs, cats, men, you know, chairs, the point is everything has an essence, that which makes it that particular thing. Another way of saying it, the necessary properties or qualities that define that thing. So, um, and by definition, this would be a minimalist kind of approach because you're not saying any accidents or non-necessary properties that it might have, but you're saying minimally what it has to have to be that thing, okay? That's a thing's essence. So, now just as a note, we're not really there yet. But at least in Aristotelianism, the difference between essence and substance is substance would be an existing essence. Or essence can be a mere category of thing, like, you know, what are the defining properties of a Pegasus, you know, or an orc, right? Um, these kinds of things are that you can have a, a lo logically coherent notion of what that might be and create a fictional genus, but that doesn't mean it actually exists. Or anybody here bake, all right? Yeah, you know, there's a big difference between a recipe for a cherry pie and an actual cherry pie. So, you know, the recipe, you could say, there's your list of ingredients and everything else, but that's not an actual cherry pie. That would be, the, you know, the list of what's necessary for it. But when it's instantiated in reality, you have a real cherry pie, okay? Well, that's really a, a quick and easy way to think about essence and substance, okay? So, so essence means, look, we've got categories of things. If we had to sort everything that exists in this room right now and say, now sort it into its different genera, which is the plural of genus, um, guess what? We put all the homo sapiens in one category. Why? Because we know what that is. So we'd sort you in the same category. All the chairs would be in one place, electronic equipment. Why? Because they each have particular things that define what they are. So 
sorting genus necessary. Uh, and I say it's minimalist in the sense it's the Latin phrase sine qua non, without which not. If you took any one of those things away, it would cease being what it is. Okay, so essential. Now, this is why when we think about what Christianity is and what's at stake, the whole point is, is that what is at stake? Eternal blessedness or eternal misery. The stakes are the highest when you get to true religion or false religion. So since God has said clearly, and as if you were in my spiritual formation world religions uh, lecture on Monday night, gave you a reason why is Jesus the only way of salvation, Christian particularism. Uh, we have good reasons, not only from scripture, but just common sense tells us that if salvation is, which it is, forgiveness and reconciliation of a broken relationship, and there's only one God, which there is, then the only way to get it is for God to bear the harm that we've caused the relationship, choose not to hold it against us, and B, that all we can do is repent, confess our sins, and trust and offer a reconciliation based on God having borne our burden of sin. That's how you reconcile any broken relationship. Hence, you need God himself becoming a man to bear the burden uh, so that um, he can actually pay the price for sin and we can, he, then he can freely forgive us and, without, and we can't work for that. So what do we need to do? We just need to repent, confess, and want the relationship again. It's easy, easy stuff, but we think about how important that is for the consequences and the blessings. So, so there we ask the very important questions, what's the essence of Christianity? Because you think about all these questions and answers and things that have come about in, in our day and age. I mean, think about something as simple, for example, would be as the Mormon church, okay? Uh, right now, the, uh, you know, the, the biggest or the largest of the Mormon churches, the one headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah, AKA the mothership, um, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I mean, you look at Joseph Smith's first vision, what was his claim? There was a 1820, there was a revival allegedly going on in Palmyra, New York at the time where he lived. And supposedly he wanted to know which one was the true church. And so he goes into this, what is now called by the Mormons, the sacred grove. And he, you know, he prays. And then God the Father, Jesus Christ, a myriad of angels, SpongeBob, Jimmy Neutron, and everybody <laughs> appear in the light above him and say, don't join any of them. They're all wrong. All their creeds are an abomination. All the professors are all corrupt, yada, yada, yada. Now, the problem is, but he specifically says, well, gee, is it the Methodist Church or the Presbyterian Church? And, you know, bottom line with that is we'll see all of those denominational distinctions are based on secondary types of doctrine, not essential doctrine. Which one is the true church? And the answer is all of them if they believe essential Christian doctrine. So he's, he says the fact that you can ask even the wrong question when it comes to this, you know, so now, now, now it makes bicycle manufacturers happy. There's a lot of bicycles in the world now, thanks to the <laughs> you know, myriad of Mormon missionaries that we have. But, but it doesn't do well for religion, so. I know that, uh, never mind, I'll, I'll, I'll do better later, but you, you get the idea. So, so as we start with, again, why is this important? We'll look at this because look, it's heaven and hell. It's eternal life and eternal punishment. It's eternal happiness versus eternal misery. It's of the highest order that we get this right. So we wanna have some minimal criteria to make sure we get this stuff right. Uh, and as I said before the break, you know, you want to make sure you're not making it more difficult to become a Christian or less difficult to become a Christian than what God actually said. Because you make it more difficult to be a follower of Christ, you're a Pharisee. Okay? You know, the Pharisees were the ones running around inventing all the new rules and all the things that you had to do before God was going to accept you. Uh, so, and also you don't want to preach a defective gospel. Uh, that, uh, again, people end up being fooled into thinking they're real believers, and they're not. So, so that said, so what is the essence of the faith, those defining doctrines of Christianity? So that's also a synonym for that would be a fundamental doctrine. Okay? Fundamental, uh, fundamental articles on page 24, doctrines without which Christianity cannot exist and the integrity of which is necessary to the preservation of the faith. 
So if you had to conceive of that, what we have, see that'd be in effect, there's our bullseye, okay, essential Christian doctrine. Okay. So now there, now skip over a little bit because I'm going to come back to secondary and tertiary stuff. Skip over to page 25 and look at approaches to fundamental articles. Okay. Clearly two categories. Okay. You can have too many or too few. Okay. You can have uh, error of excess, too many essential doctrines, error of defect, not enough essential doctrines. Clear examples of errors of excess. Uh, 1302 A.D., uh, the Pope Boniface VIII and his uh, papal encyclical, a.k.a. a papal, it's called a papal bull. That wasn't my sort of take on it, but uh, <laughs> uh, a bull is another name for an encyclical. It's a universal you know, statement by the pontiff. Um, quote, I mean, you know, 13th century, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it's absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. Okay. No. No, no, you know, uh, yeah, clearly not, okay? So, error of defect. You know, nothing about, uh, you know, there's not enough of them. Unitarian Universalism. Now, even there, to think about, well, which Unitarian Universalism, uh, the history of Unitarianism, it's really, the Unitarians are the liberals, and the U liberals were the Unitarians, okay, that called themselves Christians. And... Back in the late 16th century, the origin of the Unitarian movement is really the Socinians, uh, which is part of what they call the Radical Reformation. The, the Socinians broke off, and they were a, a heretical, you know, Reformation. The other part of the Radical Reformation was the Anabaptists, and it eventually became the Baptistic movement, which was the Orthodox part of the Radical Reformation. So there are two stages to the Reformation. Uh, but the Socinians were the ones who were questioning the Trinity and questioning the deity of Christ and questioning all, all the things the liberals ended up questioning. They just got more ammo for it in the post-Enlightenment period. Uh, and uh, so then all the Unitarians ended up adopting the Socinian strategies and doctrines and so forth. But that's just part of the, the history. So, so the, the true Unitarians were actually monotheists who believe in natural law and things like that. But all the things we think of as being necessary for defining Christianity, they didn't really have that. See, Jesus is a mere man who's the best ethical teacher who ever lived. You know, he, uh, you know, what can you say? You know, he was a Boy Scout. Uh, you know, he worked at Shalom Depot in the cabinet department. You know, he did, he did all that, right? So he was just, a, he was the man. So <clears throat> now here's the problem with Unitarian Universalism. See, everyone's going to make it in the end. Does, does anyone have to repent? No. Is there any atonement necessary? No. So everyone's just saved. Okay. So what do you have to do to go to heaven? Answer, die. So, uh, you know, uh, no repentance, no faith. So this is what we'd call justification by death alone. Okay. Uh, Say, so you don't need repentance, faith, anything else. You just die and that's all you need to go to heaven. Now, biblically, that's clearly defective. As the Bible, you know, does give us criteria for what we need to uh, to become part of and to you know to acquire basically Christ's merit that transforms us and things like we need, minimally we need to repent and trust God. Uh, so, so again, you know, that's clearly defective uh, in its approach. So, but that leads us to if you look at uh, page twenty-five, what are really in essentials are minimalist approaches. Okay. And while minimalist approaches can be helpful because you're defining clear criteria, I, I can tell you this, having dealing in the, with the apologetics community for the last 20, 25 years, is that the problem is if people talk about, well, you know, that's necessary for, it's, you know, that doctrine's not necessary for salvation or something, so I don't really concern myself with that stuff. And somehow Christianity is reduced to only being 10 or 12 lines in your doctrinal statement. But in their minds, nothing else is even important to think about. Really? What's the best way to become sanctified? That's not an important question. See, that, that, see once you're saved, once you're justified, adopted, regenerated, and you're a child of God, yeah, um, 
you've got that, but but guess what? Um, you, you don't think it's important to figure out the best way to get rid of sin in your life and to pursue holiness? Yeah, that's very important. Or, you know, something as seemingly, you know, the issue of church government. Uh, you know, that, that's not essential for salvation, but it's certainly going to, you've got to decide one of those things in your church. And why is that important? Well, uh, it's what I've been saying to you from minute one in this class. Um, look at the history of Christianity. What is it? It's, it's rising and falling institutions. It's we start something and then we give it away. But who gives it away? It's always the leadership. So how do you preserve our groups, institutions, doctrines, assets for the longest period of time? So all the stuff that you gave deeply for to support those ideas, real Christianity, now all those assets collectively are being used against us by all, all the institutions we give away. So again, so we lose it, and what do we have to do? Start over. Okay, another building program, dig deep again, right? You know, I've got to build, you know, just bought another, you know, 500 acres, start a new campus. Thought we already paid for Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Why are we doing this again, right? You know, so the idea that, you know, we do it, the people who are trustees, not only of the gospel, but of our assets and keep giving it away, we have to start over, and it means, okay, dig deep. And we lose everything from people to false doctrine to our trademark value to our assets. Because ha just having a place like this, where all of you can come and we can efficiently teach you by having those assets, ha would that be more difficult if we didn't have money and buildings and computers and things like that? Yeah, it makes the communication of the gospel that much more efficient. Now, again, in and of itself, it's not the gospel, but guess what? Assets help. So, so again, we don't want to willy-nilly throw them away. Uh, so minimalist approaches are good for certain things, but you don't want to be a minimalist Christian. You want to be a mature Christian. You want to have thought through the whole counsel of God and in understanding what are the weightier matters, important matters. Just because something's not essential doesn't mean it's not important. Okay? And in fact, I'll just, I'll just say this. Uh, like, you know, we talked about intellect and will, which I'll come back to. Again, you want to understand human behavior. Um, why does anybody do anything? Okay, and there's really two pillars. You want them to anybody to do anything. They have to first believe it's true, and then they have to believe it's important. See, now for example, I mean, truth. You'll hurt yourself if you fall out of the car. Is that important? I don't know. You want to be a road scab? You know, close the door before you drive. But see, all of you know that intuitively. Don't eat poison. Don't do, you know, it's true and it's important. So guess what? That's the stuff you know, you do, you believe, you realize. But see, at Christianity, you see people in our church who, um, you know this scenario, 10% of the people in your church do 90% of the work. Yeah. How many of them really believe, really understand the consequences and benefits here? Yeah. I'd say they probably don't even understand. So you don't really understand this is heaven and hell. This is creator created, potter clay. This is the ultimate stuff. You're, you're, you're more concerned about your hairstyle or watching the next TV show than eternal suffering or eternal glory. I don't think you really get it here. You say you love people, but you don't care about the fact that they're going to be suffering but yet you spend all your time doing X. I, you really don't understand that, or you do understand it, and you're not a real caring, loving person. So, because all of that creates a sense of urgency in us if we really understand that. that, that that's why, literally, I, I go to the end of the book of Revelation, you know, and it says, names of those not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. And I ask myself, do I really believe that? Yes. Do I really believe Jesus is the only way? Yeah. So what do I do? I spend all my time doing this, you know, because I want to know God. I want to make sure I get it right. I want to make sure friends, family, relatives, neighbors get this stuff because we'll have the rest of eternity to enjoy it. So this is a little window that we have to uh, fix the problem. So true plus important. Um, so again, those two pillars, if you can convince people of that, you'll get people active in whatever they're going to do. They'll do it. But you have to, again, raise the bar of importance, raise the bar of uh, the fact that it's true. Um, all right. 
So that said, you know, look at the minimalist approach here and understand types of theological minimalism, salvific minimalism and systemic minimalism. If you had to Venn diagram it, it'd be pretty, pretty simple. It'd be systemic minimalism would be the bigger one. In other words, what makes Christianity as a religion a minimally complete and distinct religion that distinguishes it from Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, or, or anything else? There are going to be certain things that define it systemically. Um, and that's usually what's in your 10 or 12 line doctrinal statement, which we'll get to. But then you have to really ask the question, what does someone have to know to be saved? Okay. Okay. And here's where we'll get to some, you know, and that would in essence be a subset of this bigger one. That would be our salvific minimalism. And how do we, uh, how do we even begin to um, ascertain what those doctrines are? Well, there are several places in the scripture that actually show people the gospel being preached and people getting saved in the same passage. So... Let's look at a couple of them. Look at Luke 23 in your Bibles. Hopefully you brought your Bibles. If you didn't, well, that means you didn't. So um, Luke 23, 39 to 43. And here um, there's a great, if you're ever preaching in this area, there's a great title for this as a sermon. It's called So Close Yet So Far. Um, yeah, it's two, two, two criminals nailed right next to Jesus. One of them, their heart's so far from them that they really don't get it. So uh, yet they're, they're, they're literally nailed next to the Lord of glory. Uh, one of them gets it, the other doesn't. So here, um, verse 38, it says above him the inscription, this is the king of the Jews. And then it says, verse 39, and one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save us and save yourself. But the other answered, rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God, for, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? For we indeed justly, for we're receiving what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And they said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, that is Jesus, said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, uh, get thyself off thy cross, go down, go to a new members class, go get baptized, uh, <laughs> And, and, and pursue to the end of your mortal days, and then you'll be with me in paradise. Didn't read that way in your Bible? No, okay. So, yeah, there's an immediate pronouncement of salvation. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So, so the point is, is, look, if you had to unpack this, what's going on here, and you had to put theological labels on what's going on in the passage, there are a lot of things unstated here, but one thing is true. He had a sign above his head that this is the king of the Jews. You know, who knows? Maybe the one, you know, here's, you know, two good Jewish boys who uh, went to synagogue and, you know, maybe understood Psalm 22 and maybe heard it before. And they understood, you know, maybe one of them actually heard Jesus preach. And um, but it says this is the king of the Jews. And they understood who Messiah was. Messiah was the king of the kingdom. He had authority to forgive sins and to permit entrance into the kingdom of God. And so. And what, is, what seems to be clear in the passage is, here's Jesus dying next to him, and he's saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, there's nothing explicit here, or even implicit, that says he believes he's God, but it certainly believes that he has authority to forgive sins and let people into the kingdom of God. Okay, That's clear enough. And then you start describing the rest of it, and it says, but, you know, the ones hurling abuse at him, can you imagine that guy when he, when he woke up later in the afterlife in a state of punishment going, oh man, I'm just hurling abuse at God incarnate next to me. You don't want to live for the rest of eternity with that knowledge that you were that close. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, just like the folks in John 8, 44, um, you know, well, we know now you're a Samaritan and have a demon. Were you one of the ones who wanted to say that to, to Jesus? You know, <laughs> no, okay, good. So, but then the other says what? You know, verse 41, we indeed justly for we're receiving what we deserve. Okay. Now, what would you label that as? That's actually pretty simple. That's uh, repentance and confession. So 
Repentance from the Greek word metanoeo literally means to change your mind. Confession, the primary New Testament word, homologeo, uh, and that literally means to be in agreement. So, now the context here is that, look, the way we understand confession, think about this in a criminal law context, is what? You're accused of a crime, right? Well, when we say the criminal confesses, what, what's that? It's an admission to the accusation, okay? Now, that's in a negative sense of a, of a confession. I admit I did the wrong. I admit I did the guilty, okay? Uh, that, that's the notion behind it. But that's why homo legeo literally means to have the same ideas as someone else. So you're in agreement with them. That's what confession means. So we say, you know, I know that's what I'm doing right now. So I, I just, like I said, back to Tartarus with this one. So, <laughs> all right. So we'll, uh, we'll get rid of that. So, all right. Yeah, there's no trash can in here. Normally I try and get two points at a shot here with the, uh, you know, toss them in the trash cans. But yeah, repentance, meta, noeo, and confession, homologeo, the two primary New Testament words for each of those. And what you end up with is, is literally... To get to the point where you're in agreement with someone and you were disagreeing before, what did you have to do to get to agreement? You had to have changed your mind, okay? That's why by definition, repentance has to come before a confession or agreement. To get to the point where you actually agree with the truth of Christianity, what do you have to do? Repent, you have to change your mind and be in agreement because you weren't in agreement before, so now you have to change your mind. Yeah, hold the questions till, till the end on that. So I want to uh, do this. And again, it's for the continuity of the lecture here. So, so as we continue with this, the whole point is, is that, look, this is what the guy is demonstrating in, in the passage. Repentance, confession. And then what does he do? He, he looks to Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, what would you call that? Repent, repentance, confession, he seems to understand a certain minimal, I'm a sinner, and minimally this king, king of the Jews, has authority to forgive sins and permit me into the kingdom of God. So remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he, he does what? He trusts that Christ can permit him entrance into the kingdom of God, okay? And, and can basically have his sins forgiven. I mean... And then he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Okay. And so simple, immediate, you know, the guy's pronounced he's going to paradise that day. So, so that's the instantaneous part. Now there are several other passages we can look at. Acts 2, Peter, you know, this is what we all want, right? You preach, uh, Peter's Pentecost sermon. One sermon, 3,000 people rush forward to get saved, right? Uh, you know, yeah, I'm still waiting for one of those, but... Um, but others, like Acts chapter 10, are also instructive, and I'll, I'll spend some more time there. Acts chapter 10, from beginning to end, is really what, what uh, biblical scholars would call, this is the Gentile Pentecost, okay? They're really, so as they say, three Pentecosts. There's the Jewish Pentecost in Acts 2, then the Samaritan Pentecost, and then now the Gentiles are now receiving the Holy Spirit here and speaking in tongues, uh, generally speaking. So it starts off in Acts 10, with, uh, yeah, and, and here there's all sorts of visions and everything. So it starts with Cornelius, a God-fearer, okay, is, is seeking the Lord. And then verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw a vision of an angel uh, of God who had just come to him and said, Cornelius, and told him to go, go find Peter, okay? And, of course, Peter, uh, starting around verse 9, we see that Peter, you know, now he needs to be convinced, you know, to, uh, uh, to go. So he gets in verse 9 through 16. What does he get? He gets his vision of the flying pork chops, okay? Uh, you know, so ultimately, what does the voice say? You know, it says, Peter, you can now eat Fama John. You don't have to eat Hebrew National, okay? That's, the, that's basically what the voice said. So, um, 
So the whole point was is that, you know, stop worrying about Jewish ceremonial law and custom. And, you know, now, you know, all these unclean things, you know, you know, have your ham and cheese sandwich, have your pork chops. It's OK. So he gets the vision that, guess what? You don't have to be Jewish. Keep kosher. Do that. You know, you can now go and, as I say, eat Farmer John. So they find him. He brings him to the house of Cornelius and they're all assembled there. And then you see, again, un under the inspiration of the spirit, Again, this sort of truncated, you know, here's the necessary part of, of the sermon that, um, that Peter gave. And what does it start with? Verse 34, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now God is not one to show partiality. But every nation, the man who fears him, does what is right, is welcome to him. Uh, and the word which he sent, the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Christ, you yourselves know uh, the, the, that which took place in all Judea and Galilee. And Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We were witnesses of these things. Uh, verse 40, it says, sorry, verse 49. We are witnesses of all these things. Uh, and they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day. And granted that he should become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is to us, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify, this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. End of sermon. Okay. So what do you got? You got Jesus is the Messiah, death, burial, resurrection, and anyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins. Okay, that's it. Uh, verse 44, the contemporaneous clause there. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. They were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And then uh, Peter answered and said, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit, can't he? And in order to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and stayed on for a few more days. So, so you look at that in that passage. Look, one thing that's clear, there's no such thing in the New Testament as someone who has the Holy Spirit and they're not a Christian. These are people who clearly became Christians at that point. They're regenerate. They're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, in this case, uh, what do you have? You don't have anything in that passage saying, now you must believe Jesus is God. You must believe that Jesus, you know, you must believe in the Trinity. In fact, you need to pass the Trinity quiz before you're going to get the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, yeah, you just don't see that. It's just simple gospel that's proclaimed there. Now, um, now, that said, there's some very important distinctions you want to make here. Just because there is a salvific minimalism, that doesn't mean you can't bring along, you know, understanding that this isn't the only thing you'll ever need as a Christian. And maybe, you know, you might, as you're telling the story of salvation, you might want to bring in the fact that God sent his son and J Jesus, you know, is, you know, God incarnate and things like that. And, uh, but at the same time, if someone believes that according to the scriptures they're going to be saved how how much did the did cornelius know about the trinity or christ was a god man there doesn't seem to be a whole lot that was told there and if that were really necessary for salvation that wouldn't god have thought it important enough to put it in one of these sermons you know that this is when people you know they're trying to come to salvation in christ now that said there's only one true god and if you're coming to Christ, you're doing it because why? Because of the message that's preached from Scripture. That's where we get salvation. That's where we get soteriology and atonement uh, and the fact that Jesus is the, uh, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So what do you do with someone who supposedly says they believe those minimal doctrines and then they turn around and deny the Trinity uh, they deny, you know, the, the deity of Christ and things like that. What do, you, what do you do with someone like that? 
Now, I'll just tell you this, having taught cults for 25 years and, and some of this stuff, the problem is you just usually don't ever find anyone that really does affirm salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And then, you know, they affirm that and then they end up, you know, disaffirming these other things. So it's always a package deal. Now, why? Okay, right back to methodology. What's your source of facts for your theological system? See, if it's clearly what the Bible says, you're going to get all of these main and plain doctrines of Christianity because they're clearly taught. Uh, but if your source is something else, cult leaders, uh, imagination, whatever it happened to be, see, your methodology is off, so you're going to have more errors than just this one. Because, as I said before the break, you know, we follow the A-team, faith-seeking understanding. And what does that mean? We've come to the conclusion that the Bible is God's propositional revelation and that we have good reasons to believe this is God's word to us. So we commit faith to what God says first. And then I don't understand how X, well, that's fine, but Trust and obey first, okay? God clearly said it. We have good reasons to trust this authority. And then what do we do? We reflect on it. And that's how we've produced all of these, you know, very distinct, you know, cogent uh, and clear theological statements based on the data. But what happens if you reverse that method? Instead of faith-seeking understanding, or as they, as they say, I believe in order that I might understand, uh, what if you reverse it and say, you know what, until something is reasonable to me, I'm under no duty to commit to that as a true proposition, okay? That's pretty much how every part of the, every aspect of the Christian faith gets dumped over time. I, why, why Jehovah Witnesses reject the Trinity? They can't understand how God is three in one. Uh, why, why is Christ deity? You know, Chuck, I can't understand how Christ is both God and man. So that gets chucked. So, so that's why, you know, if you reverse that, you're going to end up with heresy. So you have to start with what's a proper source of authority. So, and again, by the way, you're not a dumb dumb or unreasonable. You can't say Augustine, Anselm, and Aquinas were somehow lacking in intellectual merit. Okay. Yeah, these are literally some of the brightest bulbs of the age. So... But the point is, is to understand theology and get it right. We've got to start with the right source of facts, and it's faith-seeking understanding or the relationship of reason, how we think about these things carefully, to faith, hence the substantive content of the Scripture. Okay? That's the, the faith and reason part of it. And uh, All right, so the point is, is that someone who supposedly, if they exist at all anywhere, affirms this salvific minimalism. And I can tell you, I've, I've been doing this 25 years. I really haven't come across anybody that does that uh, because of this package deal that goes along with the methodology. You make one error because of bad methodology, you use the same methodology, it's going to continue to your other areas. And so uh, in this case, even if you could identify someone like that, there's still a lot of things that I, uh, questions that I would ask and answer. For example, see, what is a true Christian? Well, it'd be somebody who minimally has a new heart and has the Holy Spirit, right? Just nod your head, work with me. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's what a true Christian is, okay. Yeah, minimally. All right, so the whole point is, is that the same Spirit that inspired the Scriptures, and from what it clearly says, um, no person who has a new heart and the Holy Spirit is ever going to comfortably deny the Trinity and the deity of Christ and these things because they're going to be bugged by the Spirit of God because it's wrong. Just like, you know, when you sin, you fill in the blank for what your favorite sin is. Favorite doesn't mean, okay, good, you get the idea. Um, guess what? You know, you know, the Holy Spirit convicts you of that. False doctrine is a sin. You look at the deeds of the flesh in Galatians 5, heresies is one of the deeds of the flesh. So... You know, the fact is, the fruit of the Spirit is far different from the deeds of the flesh. So, so the, my point is that, look, if you ever find someone like that, which I've yet to find in my 25 years doing, you know, heretics, cult ministry, things like that, 
uh, I would still have some doubts if, unless they were really struggling with it. Now, case in point, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some examples of this. People who convert to Mormonism and some of the cults. There are people, remember, e Mormons and JWs are sheep stealers. Okay? Both of them get roughly three quarters of their new converts from existing Protestant churches. Okay? So they're not out converting atheists and skeptics and Hindus. They're basically sheep stealers. They go to us and our people and say, you're in the wrong church. We have a pure vision and all that. And I've met people and I've talked to people who were an evangelical. Then they went in the Mormon church and came out. And what they said was, is I, I was just never comfortable in there. You know, this kind of stuff had always bugged me. But so why would you join? Well, because, you know, woman tells me my husband left me. My Mormon neighbor, you know, they were trying to take care of me. I thought they loved me, you know, so I went and joined their communion. But it just bugged me. I, I just, I was uncomfortable the whole time being there. And they never really accepted the other stuff. Why? Because they had the Holy Spirit and, and had, uh, you know, had a, a good heart. Uh, and so there was some ministry of the Spirit that they were never going to be comfortable in that situation. Yet they were there for other reasons because of the care and concern and some of the other ministries. So, so that's, you know, I, I'd say that's an example of how this, how this scenario might play out in modern times. What you're not going to find is someone who has, by and large, you know, they sort of start in the cult and they start with supposedly with some minimalist, you know, understanding of Christianity and work out from there. So, all right, finally, uh, next, move over to the next one, the systemic minimalism. And... This is, as I said, on, on the big scale here, what makes Christianity a complete distinct religion, distinct from Judaism, Islam. So, you know, systemic minimalism, we've got what, you know, at least Jesus is Messiah, uh, repentance, confession, faith in Christ for salvation, uh, all that. But, but how do you distinguish Christianity just from Judaism and Islam, okay? We'll start with, do we all have the same God? You weren't very enthusiastic about that. <laughs> no, we don't have the same God. And those are the people out there trying, you know, let's kumbaya to death. Don't Muslims and Christians believe in the same God? No, uh, not at all. Uh, why? Well, let's see, because ours is triune and theirs is not. And here's a bigger one, and you might want to note this, that only the Christian God is forgiving. Because in every other false religion, which is every other religion in the world, it's all works righteousness. And works righteousness is not forgiveness. For you to earn enough merit by doing good works to pay for your bad works, that's not forgiveness. That's not, that's not somebody else, the one to whom the debt is owed, bearing the cost or the, or the harm and not holding it against you. So the point is, Allah is not, doesn't forgive anyone. The God of modern Judaism doesn't, forget, doesn't forgive anyone. Now, the Unitarian God doesn't forgive anyone. The pantheistic God doesn't forgive anyone. So it's only the biblical God that actually forgives us in the truest sense of forgiveness. So you wanna start comparing what's love, mercy, all those things. Clearly, uh, the triune God of the Bible, who is the true and the living God, is a distinct being, and importantly a distinct being from any other kind of even monotheism. Because as I, I did this in our uh, uh, spiritual formation lectures on uh, Monday, does it make a difference? Yeah, a three-person God versus a one-person God. Okay, three-person God, one-person God. Now we have the image of God, both ontological and functional. And what does it mean to be an imitator of God? All right, well, what's the perfect state of existing, operating, or being if you're a Trinitarian God? And the answer is, is to be an eternal, happy, righteous love relationship. And so God creates us male and female in his image and creates us for love and fellowship as an ultimate virtue. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourselves. 
Okay? By this, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. So that functional image of God, we in community not only love God, but we get to enjoy fellowship with multiple people, even just, you know, me and God. But what's the perfect state of being for a Unitarian God, a one-person God? To be all by yourself thinking important thoughts. Literally, that's the perfect state of being. Because by definition, God is complete, especially in a monotheist. He doesn't need us. He's not incomplete uh, without us. So this is why we look at Unitarianism and, and those movements based on it. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you've read the latest scholastic journal. Okay. See, who are the best people? Well, those would be the smartest people. Here, who are the best people, the most loving people? And by the way, when you think about those in your life, you had to value, do, do, you, do you remember the person who's smart but not kind, fondly? Or do you remember the person who's loving but not very bright, that's having more fond affection for? Yeah, and you know the answer to that. So now while we should, as we're told, love God with our mind, be transformed by the renewing of our mind, you know, iron sharpens iron. Yeah, the fact is we need to keep thinking, but we think about the hierarchy of virtues precisely grounded in who God is as a, Trini as a Trinitarian God. See, this is why we have forgiveness and love and everything here we have works and it's all based on you and your radical individualism. So, uh, so you're basi you basically will become an imitator of whatever your God is. So, so again, it really does make a difference in the structure, even ontological image of uh, how we function as human beings. So systemic minimalism, um, what's gonna define Christianity as Christian? You look on uh, page 26 and look at what these things are. And uh, let's see, I think I'm supposed to send the roll sheet around again. So go ahead and put your initials there next to your name. Um, so let's look at this here. And uh, again, th like I said, it, we're gonna try and set a minimalist list here. And if I had more time, I'd flesh out why each of these would be in the category. But, but this is going really in the order of theology, which would be the inspiration and authority, and I'd add the inerrancy of scripture. And that has to come first. Why? Because all the, all the substantive doctrines come from scripture. If you don't have scripture as your authority, you're not going to get all these other doctrines that follow if you've got a different source. So that's why you've got to have the Bible uh, as the source for these propositions. Now, most important doctrine, who is God? As I just mentioned, the triune God is, is unique, is distinct from every other kind of monotheism, and it affects everything else that goes on theologically. So again, that's necessary. Now, do you have to understand it for salvation? No, but that clearly distinguishes Christianity from every other religion. Okay, it's a unique doctrine to Christianity. Uh, the full deity and humanity of Christ, again, uh, full deity rejected by every other monotheistic religion. Um, creation ex nihilo. As I said earlier that, uh, for example, in pantheism, creation is what's, what is called ex deo, not ex nihilo. It's out of God, not out of nothing. So, or from God rather than from nothing, meaning where does the substance come from? See, in pantheism, there's only one substance that will ever exist and has always existed, and that's the divine substance. So what's creation? It's just God really having a different dream on a different day, say, or it's like a, you know, it, it's like a, I don't know, take a bubble that you can expand or something. It's just... Uh, either way, it's just it's the same stuff with the same properties and the same causal powers and the same everything. Uh, and if you're there's different kinds of pantheism, but idealism, where for example, a, a Christian scientist who's a pantheist and an absolute idealist says all is mind. Okay, so what's going on right now? So according to them, the the physical world doesn't even exist because all is God and God is spirit. So what is the physical world? It's an illusion. Okay, so what's going on right now? This is just a dream state that God's having. That's it. This is just a divine dream. So creation is just a divine dream. 
Okay? So it's ex Deo. But biblically, we can't even have us or anything that follows from it without creation ex nihilo. That God brings new stuff into existence and infuses it with its proper qualities and properties. Uh, so you have the biblical doctrine of creation is ex nihilo. Uh, now we can get into some of the reasons for that. I'm going to cover that when we get to the doctrine of creation. But find out that one of the defining characteristics of God is absolute eternality. Okay? Self-existence, things like that. Things we'll look at as incommunicable attributes. You can't give that to a creature. Well, let's say now we have God, the eternal triune God, but now there's eternal stuff that is also eternal, self-exists. Well, but, but those are defining characteristics of what a God is. So you really don't have monotheism anymore if you've got anything that's co-eternal along with God and would have any of these incommunicable properties. So, so again, that's why we start thinking about ex nihilo creation. God can't use pre-existing stuff. And then there, you know, part of what Christianity is, we start getting to the salvific aspect of it with which we're most concerned. And we have creation of us in the image of God and that gives us, you know, our capacities to love God and think about God, but also makes us morally responsible. Um, defining characteristic of Christianity is literally opposed to every other religion in the world is substitutionary atonement or vicarious satisfaction. Here, God does the work and you can't. In every other religion, you've got to do the work and God sort of helps you do the work maybe, uh, but that's it. So defining characteristic, penal substitution, vicarious satisfaction. It's a substitutionary work and God himself is doing it. Um, now here's one that's not often explained well, but yet once a year, you've got to come up with some good explanations for this on Easter Sunday, right? Uh, you know, and this is one that, you know, Paul himself in 1 Corinthians 15 says, as Christ is not risen, our faith is empty, we're still in our sins. Okay, now the question is, theologically speaking, why? Now, you, now I covered this in again, the Monday night class on why this is necessary, but this, this is actually pretty simple theologically. Um, but you hear sermons on this, and it's going to be, well, why did Christ have to rise from the dead? For resurrection power. Yeah, but how is that created to forgive? How is that connected to forgiveness of sins? Well, if Christ is risen, then we're risen. Yeah, but why? What's the connection? So you start going down the list, you know, what is the connection? Because if Christ is not risen, our faith is empty, we are still in our sins. And that's directly connected to the resurrection. Okay, here's why. Because we start with Adam and Eve, human nature, all of that in the garden. And what do we have? That we are body and soul or body and spirit. The wages of sin is death. Okay. So death is a penalty. Okay. Now both spiritual and physical. Now we can't pay it. Substitute. Okay. The one who's going to take the penalty does what? dies as a dies spiritually dies physically okay okay now here's the point it says death is a punishment if christ is still dead then he's still in a state of being punished hence the debt is not fully paid yet the fact that he comes back to life say See, that's the design of human beings is to be body and soul. It's a punishment to be out of our bodies. It's, a state, it's being in a state of punishment. That's why even dying and going to heaven, remember, that's not our final state. Our final state is resurrection. We're not, we're, God didn't design us to be angels. We're designed to be human beings, body and soul. And uh, so the fact that Christ comes back to life, so the, the resurrection is a proof that God is satisfied with the suffering or the debt that Christ has paid. So he stops punish, punishing the substitute, hence he's satisfied. So because this proves the atonement is complete, there's nothing left to do. But if he's still dead, then he's either really not the savior, okay, he's just another guy, 
or God has not yet borne the burden for sin. He's not yet satisfied since there, there can't be a free forgiveness yet because he hasn't borne the burden. So resurrection is simply proof that God is satisfied with the offering of Christ because now there's no, he's no longer in a state uh, of being penalized. Okay? So that's why bodily resurrection is a necessary part of the Christian faith. Uh, it's connected to the doctrine of the atonement. And then uh, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, once you've got the other doctrines in place, uh, it's simply, look, if, if, if we sin, there's nothing we can do about it, there's no work that we can do, then what does that mean in toto? It means if salvation is going to happen at all, it has to be a matter of a substitute, and it has to be a matter of a gift. If you can't earn it, if you're going to get it at all, it has to be a gift from someone else. Hence, you know, the, the gift of eternal life. By grace, that's what the word grace means. It means gift, if you haven't gotten that so far. Uh, so now that's pretty much, now the one at the end there, the doctrine of miracles. Why do you need the doctrine of miracles in place? Because you don't get incarnations, resurrections, uh, you know, or any of these other things without the doctrine of miracles. So hence you need that as an essential part of Christianity. So, again, you can nuance this list a little bit, but as you'll see, this is probably what you have, by and large, you know, in your 10 or 12 line doctrinal statement in your church. Okay, this is that first level of Christian doctrine. You're making statements of uh, uh, systemic minimalism. Okay, now, now I look both on page 26 and... Uh, page 24. Now we look at what a non-fundamental or a secondary doctrine is. Non-fundamental, page 24, says uh, non-fundamental articles are doctrines the denial of which does not endanger salvation. The doctrines are grounded in scripture and if correctly stated and understood are edifying to the church. It's sort of a classic uh, definition of non-fundamental. But I think a more precise way to understand this Look on page 26, and um, in a very practical way, because you want to be able to translate theory to practice all the time. That's why you just can't really look at one or the other. I think the real issue here is, bottom of page 26, what's a secondary doctrine? Secondary doctrine is a doctrine upon which a local church must agree and to which it must hold in order to preserve the unity and harmonious functioning of the local church. Or, so while it's not vitally important or essential for salvation, um, for defini defining a system of Christian doctrine, it is essential for living your Christian life. You've got to take a position on it one way or the other. Uh, it's going to affect your life one way or another if you don't, you know, whatever position you take, you're going to take a position by default on it. So it makes a difference. And these secondary ones really are the basis for how we divide in local churches, denominations, where level one, so we think about essential Christian doctrine, the systemic minimalism, these are the doctrines that really define universal Christianity. Okay? And as I said before the break, it had the universal church stayed together longer really than the first five centuries in any significant way. We'd probably have a few more statements of what we thought universal doctrine was based on a few more uh, universally accepted uh, confessions or creeds. But that said, we have our essentials in mind, but now the secondary stuff is you got to take a position on this or you're not going to actually have church live the Christian life. And some of these I already given examples on the bottom of page 26, something like church government. Yeah, there by definition, look, you, you have a local church, you got to govern your church somehow. And you're either going to be voting on elders or presbyters or, you know, um, or you're going to have a bishop that comes in and, uh, you know, a monarchian bishop who's going to, you know, run the church and appoint pastors and remove them and, um, you know, how all that works. The thing is, you just can't have more than one form of church government in the same place at the same time without chaos. So, 
So it's either one or the other, but you're just not going to, not going to have, uh, you're not going to have both. Um, the Calvinist Arminian question, you know, yeah, here, notions of justice, free will, things like that, you know, can you really maintain a, a, a harmonious local body having, you know, both ideas represented there? Yeah, sure, if nobody wants to even think about the stuff and their implications. Yeah, all this stuff, you can have all sorts of contradictory stuff if you don't want to actually think about it, you know. And if I want you to believe in the existence and non-existence of God at the same time in the same sense and uh, two horn unicorns, square circles and all that, we'll just ignore the implications of it. Um, point is, is that all right, that affects the way you do ministry, whether you take a position one way or the other on that. Um, if you think, for example... Uh, like some of our, you know, Arminian philosophers would say something like, quote, Calvinism makes God a moral monster, close quote. I um, think you can have a harmonious church staff where one side thinks the other believes in moral monsters, uh, you know, or, uh, you, know, on, 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 you know, on the Calvinist side, certain people make statements that, you know, yeah, basically you've got an anthropocentric, you know, deity, uh, you know, you, you don't believe in the sovereignty of God and you have a man-centered religion. Yeah, that makes for great harmony in the church body. And the uh, Now, of course, those are sort of extreme polemical statements that go on. The whole point is, is that, give the example, your inability or ability is going to be an issue throughout your thing. Look, if you think that man has no ability apart from regeneration and that there's a unique connection between the spirit and the word, that no apologetics is really going to, you, you can never persuade someone to be a Christian completely. Okay. Yet, if you, but see, when you think about what grace is, prevenient grace and all of that, it's always going to be a little bit of everything. How much of it is persuasion, hearing the gospel, loving people. But if you have, to, if you believe in total inability, you're going to emphasize people have to hear law gospel preaching, period, and apologetics come afterwards. Okay. Now, you still have to love them and teach them well, but they need, it's, God needs to regenerate them through hearing and preaching the gospel. Um, and again, and they need to be convicted by it, by hearing the word. Um, now, again, on the, the non-Calvinist synergistic side of things, and at the same time, that's S-Y-N, not S-I-N. Uh, that means cooperation. Um, fact is, if you see, why you, in answer to the question, why do certain people become Christians and others not, Say, the question is, whose responsibility is it? Say, were you, you weren't persuasive enough, so you have to learn more to persuade them more into the kingdom. Say, are you taking it on yourself that you weren't persuasive enough? Or is that maybe I didn't preach the gospel clearly enough? Okay, point is, is guess what? You're, there's going to be a lot of overlap on that, but you will do things differently in the church based on your theories on those things. So this is why if you're going to have this, all this discussion assumes people actually think about the implications of these things. Uh, not, but if they don't, then it doesn't matter, right? Like, you know, as I mentioned, there's this church that's split half and half, the Calvinists and Arminians. Uh, some poor guy walks into the church. He goes to the Calvinist side, and they all got together and say, hey, why'd you come over here? And he said, because I chose to. So they kicked him out. Um, <laughs> so he goes to the Arminian side of the church. And they all get together, hey, why'd you come over here? And they said, because I was sent. And they kicked him out. So, <laughs> so it just doesn't work out. So, so that's the, um, I'm sure that's apocryphal too. But uh, um, all right. So, so that's the example of, uh, again, Calvinist Arminian. Here's another one, baptism. Okay. And, you know, Again, here, there are two main views, you know, uh, either pedo-baptism or credo-baptism, either believer's baptism or, you know, baby baptisms and so forth, uh, by immersion, sprinkling, pouring, however. And uh, there's some groups of churches they call the non-sacramentarian churches, uh, Salvation Army, the Friends Churches or Quakers, uh, things like that. They're traditionally, they went as non-sacramentarian for various reasons. So the question is, is it dunk, sprinkle, pour, or dry clean? Okay, that's the, uh, you know, that's the, that's the debate. And that's the, uh, 
Well, the point is, you're not going to get four. You can't have all those views in the same church because just take the sacramental view on that. Hey, it's a means of grace. That's why you, you go to a Presbyterian church or a, you know, a Lutheran church, something like that. It's done every week. It's, it's a specific means of grace. Um, there's a specific view on how the sacrament works to, you know, it helps us, uh, again, as a means of grace. But then I'll, my guess is, you know, again, you come from your independent non-denominational church. You have a memorial view of the Lord's Supper, uh, that there's no spiritual presence or local presence or, you know, uh, majestic presence or uh, ubiquity or, you know, all that stuff. So, you know, Christ isn't present uh, in any way except that we remember him when we take communion, a noetic presence. He's present in our mind in the sense that we remember what he did. Um, and it's important for us to remember but we don't do this weekly, and my guess is if you have that, you're doing it once a month, probably the first Sunday of the month. So, yeah, because that's pretty much the generic evangelical way now, if you're an independent, non-denominational church. But the question is, is that if you think that's actually beneficial, it has an additional means of grace to help people persevere in the faith, you're going to do it more often. So if somebody says, you know, no, we need to do this every week, nah, let's just do it once a month. Try doing this. Go into your local Baptist church and suggest that you baptize babies. So how's that going to work out for you? Yeah, no, 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 not, not going to work. Yeah, that, that's where the pitchforks, torches, and everything come out, and uh, just, just not going to work. So point is, there's one. You've got to come to a view on it in your local church uh, because, again, it does have, as a means of grace, as an understanding or a symbol of Christianity, it's, a, it's an important thing. Or... Um, communion, same thing. What's significance of communion? Um, here's one, speaking in tongues, okay? Or as they say, the glossolalia. Uh, and what does glossolalia mean? It means speaking in tongues, but uh, it's, the, it's the Greek word for it. Um, so here's the point. Can, can you really have people who believe in tongues and not believe in tongues in the same church at the same time? Well, let's look at that. See how well that works out uh, based on people who have thought about the question. So you really have, you know, on one side, the true cessationist. And then on the other side, you would have what they call a full-blown first wave Pentecostal view. Okay. And start with what's the cessationist view is that there are certain sign gifts that were around in the first century for the authentication of the message. And once the Bible was complete, there simply is no more of these sign gifts, speaking in tongues and other things, because there's no more books to authenticate. Okay. So now we simply we have the books. They're recognized. They're, they're the word of God. Now we just preach the word. Okay, so, so a cessationist, let's give the two scenarios here versus uh, when I say first wave Pentecostal, per Pentecostal uh, scholars divide the Pentecostal movement into four waves now, first, second, third, and four, uh, fourth wave. The first wave, that's where we'd see, you know, the uh, assemblies of God, four square, I mean, uh, things like that, but particularly identified by the largest of these, the most popular, the assemblies of God. A first wave Pentecostalism is teaches the doctrine of there's a baptism of the Spirit subsequent to salvation, and there is the necessity of tongues as the initial evidence of that baptism of the Spirit. Now they say not everybody has the gift of tongues, but every single person will manifest tongues as the initial evidence, okay? That you have this what? This second baptism, which em either empowers you for ministry, which is the classic view, but there's a group that broke off from these called the Holiness Pentecostals. Where they say that, no, subsequent to salvation, it's not an empowerment for ministry, but essentially that's where you receive your sinless perfection, okay? So, so taking the tongues... In the classic view, you ever going to come to agreement on those two churches in the same way? Here, you're not emp fully empowered for your ministry in life yet until you've sought the second baptism and you're fully empowered. 
And that's how they're going to interpret that. So if someone comes in your AG church and everybody's, you know, they're having a tongue speaking time and someone says, stop it. This is wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to go over well. Now let's go to John MacArthur's church over here and uh, you know, or any other cessationist church and stand up in the middle of the congregation and start speaking in tongues in the middle of uh, this. So how's that going to be interpreted? Well, since it's not for today, there's only two explanations, either you're just basically uh, you're prideful and you want some attention and it's fleshly or it's demonic. You do have a tongue going through you, but it's not the, the Holy Spirit. And that's going to go over well, too, on this side. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Which is, by the way, if you look at the 1906 Azusa Street revivals and so forth. See, the people came to these revivals, came back speaking in tongues, and um, I'm not going to validate or not validate it because we have a mix mixture audience here. Uh, the whole point is they came back to their churches, spoke in tongues, say, we don't do that here, you know, left foot of fellowship. Uh, and that's why all these new Pentecostal denominations were forming right around the turn of the last century because the people who are going to these meetings weren't accepted in the then cessationist or non sign gifts churches. So you had Assemblies of God, Foursquare, Churches of God, and so forth that were built around these certain defining characteristics, uh, which not an issue of salvation, but an issue of the Christian life. Now, a couple more here, and you get the idea, and we'll take our break in a minute. I want to finish this section. Uh, here's another one. Uh, Galatarianism, aka women pastors. Yeah, so, you know, so if you're in a traditional complementarian male headship uh, church, try introducing the notion that we should call a, a female elder or senior pastor. No, you ain't going to go over well, is it? Uh, uh, or go to an egalitarian church and say, you know, these women shouldn't be in, in these positions here. You know, that's not going to go over well either. So, so now again, but what's at stake? Right. It's either you have unjust discrimination by not allowing people to do you know, gender discrimination or your traditional complementarian church. Say, look, giftedness goes along with calling. And even though, you know, if, if God calls men and it's not all men, just even just certain men, that they're going to the ones that have the gifts and abilities to actually do the job well. Uh, if you put anyone else in that position, not just a woman, but a man who isn't called to do that, you're going to end up with a very bad Christian leader. So we want to make sure that we're only dealing with the people who are called and gifted to go into those positions. So, so again, is that important for the running of your local church and making disciples? Yeah, you bet. So either way, again, there's going to be some strong and, and divided opinions on this. So as you see, is there a better and worse way of uh, becoming sanctified? Yeah. Um, I tell you this, some, again, this, uh, you know, holiness Pentecostals, you know, breakout group. And then all these, there's like, you know, breakout, breakout, sect, you know, move. But you look at certain types of holiness Pentecostals that believe subsequent and entire sanctification. Well, here's the thing. If, if you believe in entire sanctification, which here at Biola, it's really not, not, not a view, but let's just say you're a Christian and you believe that, how do you explain the sin in your life? Well, and, and again, but see, now you get into spiritual warfare theory. Well, it must not be me. It must be someone else. Say, so what do I do? I have to go get my demon of burnt toast or whatever cast out of me every week because obviously my nature's cleansed. That's what they told me. So if you've got the, you know, you've got lust, greed, anything else, well, it must be, it can't, it's not you. It has to be caused by someone else. And you read some of this literature, which I have, which uh, I get a headache when I do, but, uh, you know, I mean, literally, it's people going forth, well, get your demon of, every week, go forth, get the demon of lust cast out, get the demon of greed cast out, get the demon of, you know, acts. And then the problem is what? They never actually get better because you're not using the proper way to grow in Christ. And then people who go to the church or something like that, and guess what? They're, they're miserable, and then eventually they say, you know, Christianity didn't really work. Okay? It didn't really fix me you know, or give me this perspective. So that's why even something like that can be significant. Now, any others you want to ask about secondary kinds of stuff? Yeah. You still see the issue of, say, passivism versus just war. Yep. 
Oh yeah, I'd, I'd put that here. Uh, pacifism, just war. Yeah, use of violence, capital punishment. I mean, things like that, uh, definitely. Um, yeah, whether or not, gee, should we just be indifferent to things like homosexual marriage in the culture? Um, let's see, we should be indifferent to what God calls an abomination. You know, again, you're just not gonna have a harmonious local body there. Any other, you know, secondary stuff, you're probably gonna have to take a position on. So, probably, yeah, even though you, there's might be a way to leave that question open. Um, I haven't seen a lot of vice versa, a lot of people have done that well. Usually, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric that goes back and forth on either you don't believe the Bible or you guys have your head in the sand and not thinking well about, you know. So, so probably it's not going to go over well, but who knows. A couple others. Well, that would be your view of communion. So, you know, I put, you know, as communion views here. Yeah, um, that'd be it. So now the final thing here, and then we'll take our break. Um, so that leaves us with what? You know, our third level of doctrine. And the third level, or, you know, tertiary, which just means third level. Um, I know. Sounds so much more scholarly, though, when you say tertiary. Um, this is stuff that technically, uh, and it's also adiaphora, indifferent stuff. I mean, in one sense, it's just, you know, adiaphora as a definition. Um, what does it mean? Differences of opinion are permitted on these things as long as they're not an obstacle to preaching the gospel and true doctrine. The whole idea is that they're neither commanded or forbidden by Scripture. And often, most often, these fall in the domain of practices, not substantive doctrines. So, you know, so you think about these kinds of things. Um, now, here's one that's a wobbler in that area, but how about style of music at your church? Now, um, yeah, I'd probably still put that as a secondary issue. If, if you think that, uh, you know, traditional hymnology or something like that, you don't, you don't like, you know, how you remember if you're old, remember way back was the late 70s, Striper, the, uh, uh, you know, yeah, 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 hell with the devil, you know, yeah, heavy metal Christian stuff, I, you're probably not going to be happy or think that glorifies God on Sunday morning if you really think traditional hymns are, uh, uh, are it, so probably not, or, um, so again, there are a lot of things that are style-wise you might be able to do, but but I'd put, see stuff I'd probably put here. To a, all of these have to be qualified, but things like spiritual warfare method. See, this is one that, you know, in the end, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, somebody comes into your church floating, head spinning around, you know, speaking backwards in Latin. Pastoral staff gets together, huddle. You know, what's the best way to get rid of the demon? I don't know. And they all say, whoever got rid of the demon wins. Okay, you, you had the best spiritual warfare method. And, um, but that's, um, point is, can you actually have a debate on that? What's the best way? Now, there are going to be limits. Yeah, again, even with that, there are going to be limits on what you could be indifferent about because I've researched and taught in this area for about 20, 25 years. And you get some really weird stuff that, that, that comes in that. Uh, for example, I've seen Christians that, I'll just tell you one fairly well known, says things like, well, you know, on the issue of territorial spirits, well, the whole point, they say they make a point that, see, what we need to go do is bind the territorial spirit. And the way it's phrased is that, so the Holy Spirit is able to do his job. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, 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 no. That, that, completely off because that ends up negating basically the very nature of God. Or I've, uh, there was an academic conference at a fairly prominent uh, seminary on spiritual warfare. People are presenting these papers. I got copies of all these papers. I'm reading through it. One of the papers literally was advocating, you know, essentially having all these conversations with the demons. And so they record all the conversations and yeah, it's like, well, who are you? What is your name? Where have you been? And, you know, uh, the problem is the Bible clearly forbids spiritism, okay? You're not supposed to be engaging in conversations with the spirits. But yet it was funny because this academic paper that was presented and, and everything else 
half the paper were block quotes from demons. So I'm looking at this stuff going, you know, I haven't seen anywhere in, uh, in any style guide how to footnote a demon, uh, you know. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah. But see, even stuff like that, that passed, you know, for academic level Christianity stuff, you sort of forget the basic stuff of that God for, you know, says spiritism is an abomination. Uh, so, so even there, like I said, you still have to even be careful with this third level kind of stuff because you can end up, you know, adopting positions that negate, you know, something here or there uh, as you're doing it. All right, other third level stuff you might want to talk about, suggest anything? Yeah. yeah, you could probably compromise. This side will be the soft seats. These will side will be the hard seats. <laughs> My guess is the soft seat side will fill up first. Uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, eh, maybe. Because there, I'd, st I'd put Bible translation here only because, well, it depends on what you mean, I think. Because... I, that would be sorted according to, uh, for example, whether or not you have a paraphrase versus uh, dynamic equivalence versus something like that. Um, you want to minimally have dynamic equivalence, you know, and maybe close to word for word. But at some point, when you get to paraphrase, arguably at some point, and you're calling it a Bible, you know, you're really taking when you take the, and you're going past dynamic equivalence, how you're doing with the thought in the translation, is that, look, if every, every word of God is inspired, verbal plenary inspiration, at some point you're taking out the detail and synthesizing it. Um, you got to be careful about that. You know, uh, same thing, because a lot of times paraphrases become Bible commentaries because you're thinking a way to interpret all that section and make a, make a paraphrase of it. Yeah, and if that ends up being a commentary, don't call it the Bible. Uh, make sure you call it a, a, you know, where parts of it are commentary. But that even happens in, you know, Bible translation. Every translator has to make a choice. Uh, so, you know, sometimes, you know, you can bring out clarity and sometimes you can put your interpretation in there. So, so even there, you know, there's a line you can cross where, you know, if it's, you know, you think your church really thinks dynamic equivalence, that's sufficiently clear. And, and honors verbal plenary inspiration as a theory. But then if you get to a paraphrase, well, then it becomes here. Nope, we're not going to. Or the Joseph Smith inspired version or something like that. You know, yeah, th then it becomes a problem. Any other third level stuff you want to raise? Yeah. <laughs> Music. Well, that's why I say I, I, I'd say probably it depends where. I mean, the, you know, the college ministry or the main service, you know. Uh, is it your Friday night stuff or is it your Sunday morning stuff? Yeah. Again, I, I would say I'd probably put it here because if you think that, again, you really have a philosophy of ministry in your church, that's your guiding philosophy of ministry, that, you know, take it that we think music has to be contemporary to attract people so that, you know, they're not going to be stuck in the 17th century or something like that, then, uh, you know, if you suggest that you not use something contemporary, uh, then they say, no, that doesn't work with our philosophy of ministry. Uh, so on the other hand, if you look at liturgy or liturgical theology, uh, which is classically studied, that's a theology of worship. Okay? Fact is that, you know, there, there's, I, I think you'd probably agree, there's cr certain kind of things and, and styles that are called worship songs that don't really lead you to worship, but it's a cr performance of a Christian song. But how much of that really makes you proskuneo, okay? The word worship literally means, you know, to bow down. And it's a state of our heart where it's an act of recognizing the greatness of God and literally an act of submitting, you know. So how much is it a Christian concert versus leading people to acts of recognition of the greatness of God and the majesty of God? Um, say externally, see, you know, what do Muslims do? They're bowing down five times daily to, uh, you know, towards Mecca. 
Say, and, you know, Catholics will genuflect, you know, you get on the kneelers and do things like that. Those are symbols of what's supposed to be the state of our heart, that we're acknowledging the greatness and the majesty and the authority of God, and that we're in submission to God. So that's what true worship is. And again, the question is, as you now, as you look at what worship is throughout the Bible, the question is, does music, there's more to worship than music, okay? Any act where you're acknowledging the greatness of God and your, and your submission to God is an act of worship. So now one of the ways we can do that is acknowledge God is great in a, in a beautiful way uh, in our songs. Uh, the question is, is that's what's really happening with our folks? Uh, and I, I won't go too much into that, but uh, I'll let you make your own judgments on that. But people have definite opinions, so probably I'd put that, you know, there. Yeah. How? For give me an example of that. Um, yeah, I mean whether or not you have a harvest festival or the uh, you know um, all that stuff. Yeah, that that's probably because yeah again people are gonna have strong opinions on is this a pagan holiday where you know Jehovah Witnesses don't do any holidays, birthdays, or anything else. So, but even our churches, you know, how many of you have a harvest festival or an un-Halloween party or something as opposed to you know. Something like that at your church. Yeah, probably that. Uh, what else? Yeah. Politics. Definitely politics. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You put the uh, pro-abortion and pro-life people in the, you know, on the same staff or in the same church at the same time and that, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Dress standards. Yeah, I, I, I'd probably say, yeah, dress standards. Probably not service time, but why? Because, look, in reality, you know, old geezers, right? You know, as I say, you know, the, uh, um, you think that, look, when we go to church, it's, it's a place of holiness. It's a set-apart place. It's, so it should be God-honoring. It should be sanctified. If you think that a special time of set-apart time for God should be special, that would include, again, not making things common, but we're making them extraordinary and separate, that they're holy. And uh, so the idea of, you know, separateness and uh, all of that. Yeah, I, the fact is, if you have that, you're going to, you know, you know, look at those bums, you know, coming in with, you know, open-toed shoes and, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, Multi-campus or being a video? Um, you know, good, good question on that. I, I know several churches that are doing that. I'm just not sure how the very notion of a pastor, a, she a shepherd of the sheep, is really going to shepherd people from halfway across the country. And, uh, you know, because the idea of a pastor teacher, um, it's just that you're there to shepherd the flock. Uh, so, you know, again, the thing is, you can have a ministry like this, which isn't your church, you know, and which this is technically his parachurch. So, when you think about church, you need shepherds for the sheep. So if they're halfway across the country or somewhere else, what's the shepherding going on from the trained shepherds that are actually made available to the people? So, so again, that, that, that's an issue to at least think about. What's the, what's the very definition of a shepherding ministry? Okay. Any others we have? Yeah. Where do you put uh, differences in opinions of uh, church involvement in theonomy on one hand, theology on the other hand? Well, I'd put it here, believe me. This stuff you hear all the time, man. So, well, we're fishers of men, not cleaners of the aquarium. So, you know, we're, uh, you know, we don't have nothing to do with that dastardly political stuff. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, but the fact is, look, there's some classic positions that say literally the, the government is run by the devil and Christians have nothing to do with the government. So, you know, it'd definitely be here and that others, um, you know, the classic, for example, the classic Calvinist position and, you know, book four, chapter 20 at Calvin's Institutes is that the magistrate has Christian duties. So, and that's really where, you know, that's the vision that sort of mostly is what ended up coming to America. Uh, and that's why we ended up with, you know, governments that said in their original constitutions, like the Massachusetts state constitution, that, uh, you know, it, it's, the state must appropriate money for the public teaching and proclamation of the Christian religion because uh, morality is necessary for good government. 
Yeah. In fact, that's exactly why, if you look at historically, how this stuff is fleshed out. That's why, that's one of the reasons the Anabaptists and the Radical Reformation were persecuted in Europe by the Lutherans. And, the, you know, there was some persecution going on because they saw them as, as radicals. They saw as, no, you're not doing your part to, to keep civilization going. So, and that's why, you know, in the, the famous letter, uh, you know, to the... Uh, Danbury Baptist wrote to Thomas Jefferson after he was elected and say, yeah, well, if we, you know, we're setting up here, but we're kind of wondering how to make sure government can't come in and tell us what to do, uh, you know, and that's why Jefferson's famous language that was misconstrued in the Everson case in 1947 says, don't worry, there's a wall of separation between the church and the state, uh, but it's a one-way wall. It says a state can't come in and tell you what to believe and practice as a Christian, but the wall doesn't go the other way. Any, any citizen and any uh, religious idea can make its way into the public square until 1940 and 1947 when the Supreme Court invented new stuff and uh, kicked us out. So, yeah, so that kind of stuff is, you know, I think that's, that's if anyone's actually thinking about it, it's going to be here. But to hear stuff today like do evangelism, not politics. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I think that's going to be here. Yeah. Um, eschatology, to a degree, it depends which part of eschatology, because remember, eschatology is general uh, and personal. It deals with the intermediate state and the final state. Um, pro and again, at some point, probably on millennial views and things like that, you really need to take a position on that because how you see, how you see Christ's kingdom coming in its fullness will affect your philosophy of ministry and how you do ministry. If you're an amillennialist, but especially a postmillennialist, you'll see more responsibility for the church to take over culture and to, you know, we're the ones that are really gonna ultimately bring consummation and the fullness of kingdom to the earth. And again, you gotta nuance what that means. But on a pre-mill view is that no, we're basically gonna be hiding in the catacombs again and Christ is gonna have to come back and usher in the kingdom and consummate it and deal with the tribulation period. So that's why those folks are, you know, we're fishers of men, not cleaners of the aquarium, you know, uh, you know, antichrist is right around the corner. So there's no, no, don't, don't waste time, you know, doing all these things. So that's a, so yeah, I'd put, uh, so, so eschatology can have that view. Personal eschatology, yeah, I mean, See, personal eschatology is what's the intermediate state, what's the final state. Um, hell is an issue in personal eschatology, so yeah, that's going to be here. That that's going to divide your church. Others. Yeah. They can, but it depends on why. Yeah, like all these things, you know, why environmentalism? If you mean. Yeah, if it ends up being some weird, we have to save Mother Earth, uh, you know, kind of thing. It's like, yeah, we, as opposed to, all right, all of us recognize God made the world, that it's God's world. We need to be stewards of creation. What's the best way to do it? You could, might be able to have a good discussion on that in your local church. But it depends on whether you're, you're actually connecting Christian life or even salvation to having a particular view of, you know, taking creature care. Or however they do that. There was a question in the back. Yeah. Uh, day or time of worship. Day or time of worship. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, um, if you're a Seventh Day anything, Seventh Day Adventist, Seventh Day Baptist, there's lots of se still Sabbatarian groups uh, that are out there. That again, for again, there's well thought out reasons. They said, look, we still think the proper day to worship is the seventh day, not the first day of the week. Uh, so the whole idea of having a proper day uh, to uh, to worship, yeah, that's not something that you're going to take lightly. Oh, or even the, you know, uh, for example, Desmond Ford, who's a Seventh Day Adventist theologian, very popular one. He he had a lot. He's probably wrote the probably best books on uh, the kosher laws of the Old Testament because he was a nutritionist as well as a th theologian, and uh, he wrote a book called Worth More Than a Million. And you just look at, hey, God told people to eat a certain way. Maybe there's something to this, okay? Uh, now, even if we get to the point where we don't think it's binding on us anymore, maybe we should really think about what we put in our body.
ways, and God did give us some instructions about, you know, how not to put these things together and that things together, and maybe it wasn't merely symbolic, because, yeah, you read the book of Daniel, who are the healthier people, you know, the, the Hebrews in Babylon or the Babylonians? Remember the, you know, the diet they wanted to follow versus uh, so forth? So, uh, so point is, is that um, even though, it, you may say, even maybe the ceremonial law has been abrogated, which is sort of traditional Protestant view, um, that doesn't mean even, you know, even, you know the uh, civil law, Okay, not the moral law, but look, the justice code in Israel, okay, that's still based on divine revelation, even though it's not mandated on every culture. That still gives us some pretty good examples of how to do justice. You know, if this kind of harm occurs, what kind of damages should you pay? Yeah, it still can be a good guideline for humanity because it's still from God and divine revelation. So, so something like, you know, on what day to worship, yeah, that's definitely, you know, that's going to be a secondary issue there. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you think drinking any alcohol is a sin, aka, you know, classic, you know, cultural fundamentalism, you bet you're not going to have wine in the communion table. Uh, you know, then others, they might put shots of brandy, I don't know, for, uh, you know, depending on um, who knows what they're going to do. But, uh, but yeah, that's definitely, uh, people are going to have strong opinions on that. Anything else before we take our break? Going, uh, yes, sir. Give me an example. <sighs> Boy, yeah, for that, um, that, that's again, that's kind of a wobbler because that that's one that, in one sense, that's a practice uh, as opposed to, you know, the substance is, you know, what, what's because there are ultimately there's two things. We have to do church discipline. We have to deal with, you know, leaders gone bad. Not the same thing. You do it wrong. It's just it's an issue of justice. You're either not doing justice or you're doing an injustice. And people are, you know, we're really concerned as we're wired to be concerned about issues of fairness and justice and things like that. So someone thinks it, it's just as un, it, it's it's unjust not to punish someone for doing wrong. There's an absence of justice. It's also an injustice to punish someone who's innocent or to punish them more than what they deserve. So this is why we think about the very notion of, uh, you know, at least in, usually in conservative circles, public defenders and criminal defense attorneys often get a bad name because those are the, uh, you know, supposedly the, you know, those are the people who don't care about uh, protecting society and this and that. But actually, the good ones understand the system in, in an adversarial system where the government has all the power, all the might, all the, all the everything else, uh, and that we get presumptions of innocence. We make sure that the government never once gets a freebie. Uh, they always have to prove in every instance, they have to prove each element of the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Because uh, there can be a tendency, even for someone who's guilty, to overpunish the individual who's not represented it, who's not represented properly. And so, and that's unjust. They might be guilty of something, but not of this. It might be overstated. Somebody might be guilty of negligent homicide, but not first degree murder. Uh, and again, there's going to be a lesser penalty for that. So, now, of course, the one who's, uh, you know, simply trying to get a clear murderer off scot-free just you know, so they can make lots of money doing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, yeah. There's clearly those kind. But the idea of justice, like I said, we're just thinking about notions of justice. God, by the way, is 100 uh, percent justice because that's exactly what um, um, we'll look at this when we get to the doctrine of the atonement. But look at what Christ was doing. He was doing as a substitute remunerative justice. He lived the perfect life in our place that we can't live. So the reward for living the perfect life is you get to be in the kingdom of God if you don't sin. Okay? And that he also was a substitute for retributive justice. He took the penalty for sin. Okay? Now look at what God does. God is 100% justice. All sin is punished 100%, either in hell for eternity or punished in the Messiah himself. He's borne the burden of sin. So either way, though, you might note that sin is always punished. God is a God of justice. But, so every sin is punished, either by the substitute or not, but yet grace is small. The way is narrow, and few will find it. 
So when I think about God's holiness and then God's justice, uh, God is a constancy and an inclination and immutable constancy to holiness, which means he's always got to hate unrepentant sin. Just like we, you can't ever love un, you know, evil as a good person. So you can't have fellowship with it. You just, if you do, you're not a good person if you can love and appreciate or be indifferent to evil. So anyway, more on that. Any other final ones before we take our break? Yeah. Such as? Yeah, well, yeah, again, for them, that's clearly here. Um, question is, the reasoning behind it usually is what's important. Well, how did you get to that point? You know, public display of symbols. Uh, you know, so sometimes you have to really evaluate it. You have to go into what the reasons are behind it. So last call, and he go in once, twice. Okay, take about a five-minute break, which I know will be a 10-minute break. So go ahead and uh, uh, do what you got to do.